Okay, so I think we'll get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the inaugural event of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. Um, if you'd like to see live, live captions, just hit the live caption transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, or maybe it's already on. Um, my name is Paisley Curra, and I'm delighted to be participating as a moderator today. Before I introduce the main speakers, let me just introduce myself. I teach women and gender studies and political science at Brooklyn College and the graduate of the City University of New York. I gender studies quarterly. I also edited the volume Transgender Rights with Shimin and Rich Wong. I've served as a founding board member for the Transgender Law and Policy Institute and Global Action for Trans Equality Abroad. I've written on trans rights and their intersections with law, public policy, and feminism. And my forthcoming book, it's been forthcoming forever, but it's actually really coming out next year, um, is with NYU Press. It's called Sex Is As Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity. I'm now going to introduce the three co-founders of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. T.J. Billard is an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. They are a scholar of political communication whose research investigates the media-focused activism strategies of the US-based transgender movement and its opponents. Their current book project, Voices for Transgender Equality, Making Change in the Network's Public Sphere, draws on two years of ethnographic research to analyze how transgender activists navigate the rapidly evolving media environment to ensure social political victories for the movement. <clears throat> Avery Everhart is a PhD candidate in the Spatial Sciences Institute at the University of Southern California. Her research sits at the intersections of social, spatial, and health sciences, and she integrates humanistic approaches in her applied transgender studies work. Her dissertation investigates the geographic disparities between available and accessible gender-affirming hormone therapy, developing a human rights-based spatial model for measuring the accessibility of healthcare. Arik Zong <clears throat> excuse me, is a PhD candidate in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. Their research draws on feminist, queer, trans and queer theories, the aesthetic practices, media representation, and cultural production of transgender people of color. The current work uses a combination of YouTube video data and interview data to interrogate constructions of beauty among trans women and femmes. So today we're going to begin with TJ, Avery, and Eric talking about CATS, what it is, why it was founded, why, there's a, why there is a need for a research group centered on applied transgender studies. After they've had a turn to speak, I'm going to ask them a couple of questions of my own, and then we'll move to a Q&A with the audience. So I'm going to pass it off, which is which one of you is going to go first? I will go ahead and start us off. Um, hello, everyone. I uh, first want to thank all of you for joining us for this event today. Um, we've been positively overwhelmed uh, by the amount of excitement for the center and for our work, and we look forward to doing everything we can to live up to that excitement. Um, we wanted to start off um, this event with a short uh, kind of presentation uh, to discuss what the center is, how it operates, and why it exists, um, and also to offer, kind of as the name of this event says, a call to action. Um, applied transgender studies is our mission here at the center, but it's not a mission that we embark on alone or that we intend to monopolize. Um, applied transgender studies is about a particular approach to knowledge generation and knowledge use, um, and one that we invite you uh, all to join us in taking. So let's begin with what the center is. Um, the Center for Applied Transgender Studies, or CATS, and yes, that was intentional, you're welcome, um, is an independent nonprofit research organization that is run by transgender people for transgender people. Um, we consist of 30 fellows, um, 20 of whom are senior and distinguished fellows and 10 of whom are junior fellows. Um, and we are working in five different countries on three different continents and at some of the world's leading institutions, ranging from top universities like Princeton and Berkeley to research producing organizations like Google and NASA. Um, each of our fellows kind of independently at their home institutions pursues important research across a number of fields kind of in their home disciplines. Um, but it's our hope that by coming together at CATS outside of the context of the university and outside of the kind of disciplinary silos that tend to uh, kind of characterize the academy, um, we hope to produce empirical research that um, identifies, analyzes, and ultimately proposes solutions to 
the greatest issues facing trans communities across the globe. And it's our aim through this research to inform policymaking processes and public discourse in ways that improve quality of life for trans people in material ways. So of course, our specific approach to research deserves some comment. Here, three points are of central importance to CAPS. First is that empirical research is a double-edged sword for trans communities. By that, we mean that empirical research and the data it produces can be used either to improve conditions and life chances for trans people, or they can be used to subjugate and disempower us. We see this especially in the many ways that cis people use empirical research to advocate against our needs. But at CAPS, we choose to pursue empirical research so that we can speak back to the institutions that govern us, which by and large demand data to acknowledge our needs. At the same time, we recognize that data alone will not liberate us, and that data extracted from our communities without our consent or without our input is often actively harmful to us. That brings us to the second point, that CAPS is dedicated to building trans power because we insist upon nothing about us without us. CAPS is, despite our public focus, an intervention into the academy as well. Often, trans scholars work in isolation in cis-dominated environments, competing for resources to do work with similar ethos and goals. We are often disconnected and thus unable to create a common agenda. CAPS provides us a space to come together and collaborate and to build support structures that help build collective trans power. Together, we have both the academic expertise and the lived experience to shape better and more ethical research with more far-reaching and actionable impacts. And finally, Applied Transgender Studies offers us an opportunity, an opportunity to think and work differently and more expansively. In contrast to the humanistic field of trans studies and in contrast to the wider disciplinary dogmatism we find in most academic departments, Applied Transgender Studies is agnostic to theory and method. We have no canon and no standard toolkit. Theory and method are tools for analysis, but uh, what matters most to us is the objects of analysis. What unifies Applied Transgender Studies is a shared dedication to solving practical problems through whatever means we find most effective and a dedication to learning from each other's disparate approaches to build a better world. So to that end, we'll wrap up with an exciting announcement. Uh, this is something we've been like <laughs> waiting to share with everyone, but the Center for Applied Transgender Studies is partnering with Northwestern University Libraries to publish a platinum open access online journal, the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies, which will release its first issue in uh, early 2022. Uh, the journal will serve as a space for the kinds of work that we advocate for and in keeping with our mission of ensuring positive impact on the world. It will deliber deliberately cater to both academic and non-academic publics. More details will be forthcoming in the near future, so look out for more from us on that. So uh, thank you all again so much for joining us. We're looking forward to a lively conversation for our remaining time. All right, thank you. So I'm just going to ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to the um, to the audience. So I guess my first question is, what does applied transgender studies look like in practice? Like, what does it mean to do applied transgender studies? Because every academic thinks their work is great, great applications to the real world. But what what do you folks mean by applied? Yeah, so I think that our vision of applied transgender studies um, in terms of like the practice of what it means to do, well, there are kind of a couple of things there. One of which is um, in terms of the actual production of knowledge, we are frequently kind of guided in terms of the questions that we choose to answer and the methods that we choose to use. Um, you know, we orient ourselves by um, attaining the goals of whatever our professional norms are, the department expectations for tenure or the book expectations for trying to get a job or um, what is or is not sociology or is or is not political science, the boundary work that kind of happens in that. And the point of applied transgender studies in a lot of ways is setting aside those kinds of concerns that govern and structure the work that we do. And instead the focus isn't on what's the right theoretical questions to kind of be important in the field. It's what are the right questions 
to solve the most pressing problems that exist in the world. Um, and related to that, it's also about the publics that we choose to engage with, right? So Michael Warner kind of had that famous opening to his essay on publics and counter publics where he says, you are currently reading this essay, therefore you are this essay's public. Um, and when we do academic writing, when we do academic speaking, um, all these various things, we have particular publics in mind, usually other academics. Um, and while we definitely want to include academics in our publics for a variety of reasons, our we don't measure our success uh, in doing applied transgender studies based on the number of citations we get or accolades like that. We're looking at different metrics of success. We're looking at different publics to have an impact on and for them to be receiving and working with um, our work. And I think that for me is kind of what identifies applied trans studies um, as being different in some ways from, from other research. Okay, so, and then in a follow-up, um... So what about the, um, how, did, how does human, humanistic, the social science scholarship, how do those different areas fit into applied trans studies? Like what disciplines would you folks be looking to? I know you, I know TJ just said, we don't do disciplines, but still I have that brain shaped that way. So I'm asking. Yeah, for sure. I think, especially, you know, a lot of us are in academia, obviously, you know, we all went through academia in some form or other. Um, and a lot of academia is very kind of focused on slotting people into disciplines. Um, I think that's something that, I think the three of us all do uh, pretty interdisciplinary work. Um, for me, I think a lot about like uh, breaking down some of those barriers and thinking about, well, you know, each of these fields, you know, they have their own sort of canon, their own theoretical foundations, their own sort of expectations for people who are in those fields, what kinds of scholarship they're, they're expected to produce. When we were thinking about what applied transgender studies means and what it encompasses, we're thinking more about what is the object of study, as I mentioned, um, thinking about how we can use methods or uh, foundational literature in some of these fields to tackle the question of improving material conditions for transgender people and communities. Um, a lot of um, a lot of work or a lot of uh, ways that we can tackle those issues, we can draw from these disciplines. So um, I think there's definitely a tendency to want to divide into disciplines. Um, and I think part of the work of CATS is to is to try to bring us together rather than split us apart more over the question of discipline. And I think also to that point that, um, you know, a lot of the comments that we got from different people when talking about different iterations of applied trans studies as we kind of built this out and Arik and I facilitated a um, reading group here at Northwestern um, on applied trans studies this past winter. And we kind of got a lot of questions about was applied trans studies basically a way of saying social science trans studies as opposed to humanities trans studies? And for us, that was like, no, like while we understand the ways that certain people can put, like view that as a natural distinction point, we don't view applied trans studies as having any particular kind of approach in that way. And humanistic work absolutely can and frequently does fit into what we view as applied trans studies alongside other types of things that don't fit into this humanist versus social scientist battle, right? Like we have the natural sciences, incredibly important. Um, and among CATS fellows, we have people who are doing neuroscience and various different forms of like truly STEM, STEM research. But also you look at things like legal analysis that are like of the utmost importance to um, the ways that we can kind of put research into practice in public policy and things like that. And so, um, I, yeah, I think for us, we do take quite an expansive vision of um, applied trans studies and at, in terms of what we otherwise in the academy think of as kind of rivalry divides in kind of the humanities versus the social sciences or any number of other divides, you know, the social versus the scientific. Um, and we're not interested in those. Uh, uh, and we've, you know, succeeded in building a, a center that bridges gaps that you would not ordinarily find bridged elsewhere um, to 
indulge in a slight amount of narcissism in saying that, but I do think that we did well at, at, at that, if, if nothing else. Okay, um, so here's, here's another question about uh, fields. How does applied transgender studies fit into the still nascent field of transgender studies? Like what's the relationship between them? I'll take this one. Um, so I think one really big important intervention that transgender studies sort of broadly conceived in a typical genealogy where we might trace it back to Sandy Stone and Susan Stryker and then to scholars like yourself, Paisley, and others who were inside and outside of certain iterations of cultural studies or humanities fields, that's something that changed when studies on transgender people moved into this more humanistic realm was that now trans people were the ones doing it largely, that those early people that were starting to publish and write both from lived experience and through their own methods and disciplines, that was one of the first iterations where we saw trans people being the authors of the work. Whereas we know from a lot of those same trans studies scholars that trans people have always had influence in shaping what you know, biomedical researchers thought or psychiatrists thought transness was, uh, now you actually see people being, you know, authors of our own lived experiences. In addition to this longer tradition of life writing and things like that, where you see authorship as like something that is contested. And I think what we have learned from that is how to build trans power, how to learn from putting forward ourselves as actual authors of our own experiences and of our communities in much more broad ways. And that we're indebted in many ways to the broader idea of what trans studies is at the same time that in some ways we have a critique of it as being limited to certain disciplines. And while I think that it's fair that there are some of those you know, limitations and expectations that transgender studies is more humanities work, it makes sense that it would be that way because again, like a lot of uh, even social scientific work, um, let alone medical research, is largely by people who aren't trans. What we are hoping to do is change that and to also be informed by this longer history of trans studies that's happening outside of maybe our own disciplines and learn from it. And the thing is like talking to some of the other fellows, like I know some who are on the call who are in way more STEM spaces, they're reading Jules Jill Peterson's Histories of the Transgender Child. They're reading Stryker's Transgender History I keep transgender rights the volume on my desk, even though I'm a quantitative medical geographer, because I, I need to be able to think with us and our genealogies. I need to be able to think with the theories that we've had about like what is what is trans life and also what does it mean that trans people's life chances are limited. So I think there's a direct and necessary relationship, and I don't really imagine it as contentious. I definitely like Eric and TJ have been saying. I want to resist the idea that there's some kind of turf war, no pun intended, over uh, who gets to claim trans studies. But really, I think that transgender studies is at its best when all the people that are working on it that have this deep and ethical commitment to our communities are actually in conversation with one another. And I think that's the kind of thing that we want to do with the Center for Applied Transgender Studies is actually say, you know, instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, if, if we disagree with maybe some of the skepticism of empirical research or things like that, what if we instead uplift the existing theories and say, you know, what does this have to do with how we do our work? If, if I read, you know, some of these historical pieces and it changes the way that I think about this, what does that look like in practice for me to change my own work in modeling geographic access to care? And it does change it if you take it seriously. So I think that's, that's really what, what the relationship is to trans studies as it already exists that we're trying to cultivate. Yeah, and I think to build off of that, that um, you know, trans studies has in many ways necessarily been an exercise in field building, kind of vis-a-vis -vis existing institutions, so largely vis-a-vis -vis queer theory, um, cultural studies. And so the establishment of like the trans studies cluster higher at U of A and the establishment of TSQ have been kind of important like flagpoles in setting up um, a field that is, as Avery kind of said, a space where we see trans authorship, we see trans theories and like we care about trans lives for the sake of trans lives and not because of the ways that they extend some uh, theoretical agenda, right? Um, but for applied trans studies, a large part of 
the impetus for doing this was creating a space for people who are trans and do work on that matter to trans issues, but who don't fit into the field of trans studies. And so how do we create an institutional space that supports, promotes, and facilitates the kinds of work that has the same ethos as trans studies, but doesn't necessarily like do trans studies in, in that same way. Okay, um, and if other people have questions about that, we, you know, we have the Q&A. So my last question is, we've talked about the applied, we've talked about the studies in terms of the fields or getting rid of the boundaries, but like, here's my question is like, why trans? Like, why not be part of a feminist think tank or an LGB slash T? you know, research place, why separate transgender uh, Center for Applied Research? I can try, I can take a first, first pass at it and then please do back me up to Jay Eric or Paisley also, I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, I think even in the way that you pose the question, you've kind of given me an answer or at least started what I'm gonna say, like the LGB slash T. I feel like, and I'm trying to use my I statements because I'm not coming for anybody, but I feel like a lot of LGBT orgs lack trans leadership and trans issues are something that they may use for fundraising and that they may use for research purposes and they may garner tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to do whatever kind of research that they do. But without that trans leadership on your executive board, without the people in the room that are actually shaping the, the research agendas that are shaping the policy agenda, it's not actually gonna be responsive to our communities. You can have the best, you know, most community-based participatory research program with trans people. And if you don't have trans people on your staff, if you don't have trans people who are designing the research, it's still gonna hit different because it's not, really going to show up to the average trans person as really and truly being responsive to us. Like you can look throughout the literature and see what happens when trans people are directly involved in the collection of data on our lives, that it totally opens the door. I know Arik could speak to that as well. I peer reviewed a piece last year that turned out to be written by a friend that was like literally about this thing, about an insider outsider perspective of when you're trans and you research with your communities and you're considered an outsider because you're positioning yourself as researcher but you're an insider because you share the experience of being trans that you get a different kind of data you get a different kind of information so i feel like at least on that front in terms of lgbt organizations we need a trans specific one that doesn't mean that when we do trans specific and trans led research that we won't also come up with things that have implications for people who are cis but queer lgb whatever it is that it won't have implications also at times for people who are intersex and wouldn't consider themselves trans, although there are some who consider themselves trans and many who don't. And it doesn't mean that you know a trans research agenda, a trans policy agenda won't also have larger implications for an overall feminist or women and girls sort of perspective in the policy world. I think what happens is when we center trans people, the assumption is that, and again, it's an assumption because we've almost never been centered in history in this work, that when we center us, only our needs will be met. But I would counter argue that, in fact, if we center the most marginalized, especially among trans communities, if we center the most marginalized, if we put forward a racial and economic justice agenda about you know, improving the life chances of trans people, then that is going to have far-reaching implications for everyone else. That is necessarily a feminist agenda. That is necessarily a queer and trans agenda. That is necessarily going to have you know, implications at all these intersections of life that are often, you know, totally left off because of the way that powers that be, funding structures, whatever it is, research, um, scientific and governmental organizations, whoever it is that's funding this work, that's sort of guiding it with the invisible hand about putting the dollars into the hands of researchers, that those things change fundamentally once we put trans people at the center. So that's why, in my opinion, not not to just start a broader feminist org or to join one and try to push it toward trans things and instead do something that's for trans people by trans people. And I would add to that too, we're seeing a lot of, a lot more organizations that are starting to crop up that are trans led and, you know, cuts currently we're sort of building up our like agenda and what we're trying to do, how we're trying to partner with orgs, but we've been in conversations with some of these orgs um, about 
finding ways to bridge research and advocacy work. Um, uh, I want to, I kind of mainly just want to take this time to like shout out some orgs like Race Space Alliance in Chicago, Trans Latino or, uh, Coalition, these orgs that are like led by trans people and provide services for trans people. Um, and I think, um, yeah, as Avery, I just want to <laughs> echo Avery's answer, which was really good. I don't really have a lot to add to that, but just want to echo, like when we see trans people who are in charge of orgs and in charge of kind of the research agendas and the advocacy work, um, we see how, how our needs are understood and are met and are centered in those, in those, um, the advocacy work and the research that people do. Um, whereas I think, you know, this isn't necessarily to say that feminists and LGB orgs don't do that work and don't contribute to that work. But I think there's a lot to be said about putting trans people in charge um, and uh, in positions to define the, the agendas. I would just add being rather long in the tooth here and having known a lot of these national groups for a long time, it's just hard to take it when groups that wouldn't consider doing work on or advocating for trans communities because they didn't see it as useful to them. So they kind of instrumentalizing trans people is not useful. Now that there's all this grant money, now that there's so much you know interest in trans issues, then suddenly they take it on. I just, it's, it, it really, it's just, it's just to me that their ethics are not like where we want them to be, you know, because um, I th can think of small groups that took on trans issues before it was very, very cool, like the National Center for Lesbian Rights and these, some of these other large unnamed groups, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't touch it. So that means like, what are they not going to touch now? Like, are they talking about incarceration or that doesn't go with their focus group politics? So that, that would just be my two cents on that. Okay, so we have a lot of we have a lot of questions. So we just so we just go through them in in order. Okay, great. So, um, how should we proceed? Did someone want to take? Do you want to just? Shall I read it aloud? Or people could. I would say I think I saw one that was specific to my work, and if it's okay with that person, I'd rather answer it privately, if that's fine. So we can focus on the, the center's agenda. But I appreciate the question. Okay. So the next question is from Lori Powell. Um, as most of you know, the LGBTQ plus movement, whether it be advocacy, research, policy, is no less susceptible to being blind to racial and economic injustice than any other group. Can you talk about how you plan to make sure the research that CATS produces will examine the whole breadth of the trans community and finally free me from having to use the two, 2015 USTS ever again? Okay, well, I'll say we can't make promises about your needing to use 2015 USTS ever again. Um, that, that would be too big of a promise to make um, two months into existence. Um, but I can say um, in terms of um, making sure that the work that we do is less blind to racial and economic injustice, there are a few different things there. One of which is our, um, our focus on who it is that we invite into um, the center and to do work and, and the, the ways that we choose to um, represent various diversities um, across the fellows in our center, both intellectually, but also pertaining to things like um, race, nationality, so on. Um, we kind of are in the early phases, so by no means have we done perfectly, um, but we are currently just under 50% um, people of color in our membership. Um, and we hope for that number to stay the same, if not grow um, over time, um, as we introduce new fellows to the center. Um, we also have uh, the ability to, um, in moving forward with a journal, create policies um, for research in terms of like, research that employs demographic data must attend to the specificities of race in their data, right? And there are ways that we can kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like uh, build in um, expectations um, in that way. Um, I don't know if Avery or Reed want to say anything further to that. Yeah, I think another thing that I kind of alluded to earlier is that in some of the partnerships that we're, 
I shouldn't say partnerships because they're just conversations at this point, but some of the conversations we've been having with like orgs, for example, are um, orgs that do uh, provide, that do focus on providing services for, for example, um, uh, trans of color communities. Um, so that's also something that's guiding how we're entering into advocacy and um, seeking out potential potential partnerships. I keep saying partnerships as if we're like <laughs> officially entering into things right now. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that is on our mind as we're talking as we're thinking of how to build our uh, research and advocacy agendas. I think I also want to add really quick um, that if I can put it in different words, what I think TJ was trying to say, we are trying to set different expectations. We're trying to establish new norms of what representation and leadership structure looks like, and also in terms of what the research agenda looks like. And I have to use the 2015 USTS data for my dissertation. So I owe my PhD in some way to a data set that is deeply flawed. If you look at it without the demographic weights, which were used to try to make it more racially representative as a correction to be more akin to the general population, it's over 80% white respondents. And without saying anything specific about like my theory behind why that might be, we do know that it wasn't as if it's a randomized sample, it was a convenience sample and it was led by a particular organization at a particular time. So it, it kind of makes sense in that context how it ended up being so overwhelmingly white and that does limit its generalizability. That means that at times I have called it a stranglehold, but I will say instead a deep influence that the USTS data has had on the scientific literature about transgender life, it's gotta go because it's, it's deeply not representative of our larger communities. And in fact, we don't have you know, great data about that. So part of what we want to do is not just set those different expectations, establish new norms in terms of leadership structure, but also think about when we do primary data collection, either as fellows and affiliated with CAS or through CAS directly, that a priority is going to be making sure that we correct for the existing biases that have trickled into the literature via the influence of some of these much larger data sets and things like that. Okay, so the next question is from Charles Epley. How can people not currently affiliated with CATS work with the center? How does one become a junior fellow, a senior fellow, et cetera? Okay, so um, affiliation, yes. So we, we currently kind of have, we, have, so we currently have 30 fellows um, and we are going to on an annual basis moving forward. Um, have calls for people to apply. They will be reviewed by a membership committee um, and then kind of recommended for the board to appoint them as fellows. Um, without getting too deep into the kind of intricacies of an internal governing structure, um, being a fellow isn't just an affiliation the way that it is in certain centers, um, especially centers that are based at universities where it's kind of like uh, more than anything else, like an honorary thing and a standing invitation to show up to events and things like that. Um, we are a nonprofit organization that has a membership structure. And so being a fellow is being a member of the organization. And so in addition to rights and privileges, uh, being a member also comes with responsibilities because we, none of us are professional staff, none of us are paid for anything. It's all um, voluntary labor in the way that, you know, professional societies that you might participate in are. Um, and so we will have this annual call for additional members, but um, yeah, for us, being a member is literally being part of the engine of the organization rather than in affiliation um, per se. Um, but beyond um, membership, uh, there are plenty of ways to get involved in terms of participation in our regular event programming, which uh, COVID has kind of uh, catalyzed this, but we will, for our purposes, stay uh, online even as the rest of the world. Uh, goes back in person because we are an international organization scattered across the globe um, and we do for example have this journal coming up and so there'll be opportunities to engage with research through submission and peer review um, and other ways to become involved in um, the work that we're doing in that way. Right. From Chris, uh, Christine Minah. 
do you envision specific studies to compare international differences in practical aspects such as medical aspects of care? I mean, I think we've been shying away again, just a reminder, it's been two months since we launched. Um, and I think something that we wanna emphasize as well is like we have been overwhelmed in a fantastic way, but overwhelmed by the, the response that we've gotten. We kind of thought this wasn't gonna you know, happen or really have all that much fanfare associated with it. So we're really glad that you know there's 120-ish people that are here attending um, and that you know we generated enough hype that Paisley was interested in actually being involved with this event, for example. So we're really flattered, but we're not yet to the point of being able to establish a very specific research agenda. With that said, I'm somebody that um, I really value my global collaborators. Um, I'm co-chairing and on the steering committee for the upcoming conference, Converging Crises, that's with the Transgender Professional Association for Transgender Health. And we made a point to have as much of a globally representative steering committee as we could for the conference. Um, and so like, it, it's something that's definitely not just on my mind, but on everybody's, even if particular fellows that are associated with the center might have just domestic focus for wherever they're from. It is something that we're aware of that we want to be looking at international implications. But in terms of a super specific research agenda, we don't really have that yet. So I don't know about international, you know, comparison of, of aspects of care, for example. Yeah, so I want to caveat that point. So in terms of envisaging specific studies, part of the reason why we don't have that laid out right now is like, as with all things, money, right? And so the the research funding thing that will happen. Uh, and, and that will in many ways help us kind of determine what the specifics of the research agenda are, um, because it will matter about what people are coming to us uh, among our fellows with desires for funding to do. Um, I will say that we are, as an organization, I, I kind of said in our little presentation thing, um, we have fellows from five different countries and that's the countries that they work in. That's not just the countries that they are from or the countries that they do research um, in or uh, that they kind of, uh, um, yeah, that they bring um, as a kind of empirical focus. So because of our kind of collaborative structure, they will kind of by necessity be a lot of international comparison that works. Um, and one of the major um, benefits to the work that we're trying to do with the fellows that we've assembled is that we want to be able to produce work that does speak to kind of a broader set of needs that the trans community has that isn't like we're not you know the united states center for applied transgender studies right um, and we don't want that to ever come across in the work that we do or the membership that we have and so we've, we've done our best that we can to avoid that okay the next question is from gina roberts Finding work at universities is really difficult now more than ever, at least in the UK. How can CATS help scholars within trans studies to do research who lack the privileged position of being employed at a university? Or is CATS only for people working within university? Well, I'll answer the second part of that first, which is it's absolutely not only for people working within universities and several of our fellows don't. They either work at advocacy organizations, uh, they uh, do independent consulting work. They work at major institutions um, that are kind of corporate or uh, governmental. And so no, by no means are we only um, for or comprised of people working within universities. Um, but one of the things that we do have uh, kind of built into our structure, I mentioned earlier, we have um, senior fellows and junior fellows. The junior fellows are people who are still pursuing their degrees, they've not completed them. And having the structure that we have is also meant to promote the place of trans people in the academy by providing a mentorship structure in a variety of ways. Um, when you're an academic, either in a position or as a grad student, you're frequently um, the only trans person in your department, if not one of a handful at your entire university. Um, and so we are very aware of that having all done it <laughs> in our lives. Um, and so for us, we wanted to create a center that would provide resources for, provide mentorship for, and provide um, real meaningful support for um, 
graduate students, not necessarily to keep them in the academy, uh, though certainly to make it more possible if they want to, but to provide them um, with mentorship on paths forward so that we can make sure um, that um, scholars doing this work do come out of their degrees um, into opportunities to continue doing their work in meaningful ways. Um, Eric, did you want to add to that or we good? Oh, no, I was just, I was just marking uh, oh, okay. questions as we got through them. Okay, good. Um, the next question is from Jack McLaren. As a young scholar, grad student, how do you suggest walking the line between working to build a career, read publishing in academic venues, et cetera, and also making research applicable to different publics in an applied way? I'm happy to take a stab at this one. Um, it's a fantastic question. It's something that I'm navigating now as somebody who's entering job market in a few short months. Um, and I actually have the goal of getting some kind of tenure track position somewhere. Um, although I will absolutely scramble and, and do something else working in a public health department, something else if need be. Um, and I think it's a really difficult balance to strike and especially with the market being what it is you feel like you're walking on the edge of a knife and that if you tip too far one way into the applied world or having real world impact and doing that kind of research that you may not be legible, especially if in your, if in your environment that you're coming out of or in the, the sort of places and institutions that you're applying for jobs at, that they may not value that kind of public scholarship, it can be really, really stressful. Um, and so for me, something that I try to do is lead with my values um, and say like there are some journals that are run by some people who are terrible and so I do not submit there and that is at least something that I can say I'm not going to do that and thinking of a particular journal that I won't name that is run by somebody who should never have done any research on trans people and is patently known as being awful um, however I do have to think strategically sometimes about like okay well let me try to get something in a higher impact factor journal and then I'll couple that with being like, maybe I'm going to, you know, find an opportunity to speak to a more broad audience by putting something on medium that's a, that's a sort of go along beside it, or I will, you know, maybe I shouldn't say this in terms of copyright, but I'll release three PDFs of what I work on so that people who might find it useful will be able to do that. And I think for us at CAST, something that we really value is that platinum open access orientation, that ethos. Um, in the journal that we're starting, that when you publish with BAT, anybody can read it. And there aren't going to be those sort of predatory article processing fees. We won't have that same kind of structure where, you know, you have to pay like $4,000 to make sure that other people can read it free, for example. Instead, it's just going to be from the bottom up, like it's going to be free. But of course, the, the existing structure of how journals are indexed and all of these things, that type of work isn't necessarily rewarded, but it's still a peer reviewed journal. So I think it sometimes turns into a trade off and either you create more work for yourself by having to do double time. I wanna make sure I put out something that's applied and useful for advocacy for everything I put out that's just research and just me. But I think it's something that I have started to feel better, out, better about the more I go along, the more I do it. And I think it's something that I, that I think all of us at CAS probably struggle with on some level, but Collectively, I definitely see us being able to build both infrastructure to be able to do impact oriented research that's also peer reviewed, that's also, you know, legible to institutions and to still stay true to our values and our ethos of making sure that this is ultimately about improving the lives of transgender people, not about building our own careers necessarily. I also think that for better or worse, and it is often worse because it's frequently based in like the neoliberal ethos of self framing and whatever. Uh, but universities are increasingly um, incentivizing and rewarding more public facing work. Um, and so I, I do think that in some respects, there is still a problem, but a, a less significant problem than there perhaps once was. But it is, to Avery's point, one of the reasons why, for example, um, we've decided to um, launch this journal for a variety of other reasons, but one of them being that it can it is a venue to simultaneously fulfill the expected functions of the academy when it comes to things like publishing, but can still be oriented towards the goals and missions of um, public facing work um, and public intervention work that the center kind of has at the heart of its mission. And so, you know, are we always going to be able to, to perfectly do everything? 
um, so that we're satisfying everybody? No, but we are trying to do our best to create um, systems that will allow for um, us to fulfill multiple different roles as scholars um, to the greatest extent that we can. I would say too, I know, um, I don't know off the top of my head, but these things are called, but I've heard of these um, like workshops and training programs. I know Northwestern, we have one that, it, that are sort of oriented towards training people on, especially people in STEM on um, public communication and public uh, scholarship. Um, so if your university has something like that, I know, like I mentioned, Northwestern has, some, has one that's uh, you can apply for to sort of go through a workshop uh, if you're in a STEM field to like uh, be trained kind of in public public scholarship. And I think there's some orgs that do it like, or that have, um, that operate outside specific universities. Um, so those are some ways that it, you can sort of seek out some of that training to, because I know a, a lot of our fields, like we don't get that training in our coursework or in the kinds of work that we have to produce for our programs. We don't necessarily get the kind of training to like write for um, public audiences. So those are some opportunities if, if, you're, if your um, university has a partnership with one of these orgs or does its own workshop program like that. Um, okay, so the next question, Derek Siegel. What tools, resources are out there and on the horizon for trans scholars who want to do more applied work, both at the beginning of a research project and in terms of academic research we're already doing? I, I think a short answer, although um, I know TJ and Arif may actually have some more practical advice because they recently led a, a reading group on applied trans studies. Um, and I think there's another question asking for some examples of what applied trans studies work might look like. So that might be something that, that if they have it handy, they can share is what they read in that group. Um, but I think a short answer is that there isn't really a blueprint for this. Um, again, because the structures aren't set up to incentivize um, this type of impact-oriented research that also is legible, peer-reviewed in academic venues, et cetera. So it's not as if we think we're actually, you know, inventing something from scratch, but more so that there are fewer examples than maybe we thought or expected to see uh, in terms of this. Um, so we're definitely open also if people have resources to share about what that might look like um, and how we can make things more publicly available. Um, but in the meantime, I think like we're mostly just trying to create those kinds of opportunities within the broadest definition of trans studies in the hopes that we can figure out what that looks like together. And one of the reasons for that being that that we you know have an institutional home as cats is because a lot of times that's not necessarily just about us and the work that we do right a lot of times it's about the work that we are doing with other people it's about the partnerships that we end up building with other institutions and organizations and that's a lot easier to do you know kind of institution to institution than as an individual trying to work with them and so cats provides a home a center and a hub for us to engage in that kind of collaborative work with whether it's policymakers or with advocacy organizations or with media so that we can do that kind of um application part of the work once the research itself is is done okay uh the next question is from Eli Keen, I know there's an emphasis on, emp on empirical research. Are you open to accepting fellows in the future who do more theoretical work? I would say, um, I mean, I can't speak for the whole, like the membership committee I'm right now, but I would say like, it depends on what um, your, what your research looks like. Um, I, because, like I mentioned before, a lot of us do um, interdisciplinary work. A lot of my work is kind of actually a little bit, sometimes airs a little bit more on the theoretical side. Um, so we're building sort of um, the kinds of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, sorry, I'm like blanking on this word that I'm trying to think of. Um, I think we would, <laughs> 
that we would look at your application if you apply, for example, to be a fellow, we would look at your application holistically, I think. Um, we're still building up that process now, so I can't say for certain um, what it will look like. Uh, sorry, that was like a terrible answer. Well, I think one of, there, there are two things. One of them being that we're looking for a set of fellows who do not all look like each other on a variety of axes, including the approach that we take to doing work, right? The strength of the center comes from the fact that we have people who approach the same fundamental issues and topics from myriad different approaches that are all divergent from one another, but coming together in kind of unique ways to produce new insights, right? And so in that way, yes, absolutely, there are places for people who do more theoretical work as they fit um, into the broader picture of fellows. At the same time, uh, to kind of talk back to the empirical part, by empirical, we don't necessarily mean social scientific. By empirical, we just mean deals with like empirical objects, right? Um, so you can have more or less theoretical approaches to those empirical objects, right? Our focus on empirical was more meant to address um, the fact that we're not, um, we're not, you know, here to do philosophy, right, uh, necessarily. Um, we're looking at, um, we're not looking at readings of films and novels and what they say about trans life because that's just not the kind of scope of what we do. Um, so yes, the, the empirical part as the centerpiece is more about how much it engages with material conditions of life um, and less to do with how theoretical the work is. Okay, I'm going to combine two. I'm going to skip a couple and combine two questions because they're like uh, interesting and more uh, new. It's from Lindsay Young. What role would you like? Would, what role would would your team like to see allies like cis researchers play in supporting trans research by trans people? And from Sarah Jane Dube, how would you like academics researchers to support and promote cats beyond citations? That's a really good question. And I think the three of us are also going to have very different answers. So maybe take that with a grain of salt in terms of we're speaking, you know, both as individuals and partially on, on behalf of CAST, take from that what you will. I think, uh, I think material support of trans-led research is something that we actually don't have a whole lot of a model for. And um, so something that I will just share an experience of being approached last year. Um, that went fantastic, and I will shout out um, Christy Gamerell at UMICH that she approached me wanting me to collaborate on something because of my expertise that wasn't just about being trans, but was also about you have a methodological expertise, and I see that you have done this kind of work with trans people before, and she has an existing uh, collaboration with an organization called uh, Sistas in Detroit that's trans women of color, um, and she's been working with them for a long time. And she wanted to do something that was totally innovative, approached me and was like, hey, are you interested? And when I opened the call um, and said, so what brought you to the work? She had a fantastic answer that was like, you know, she didn't try to say like, oh, well, I cared. Like she was like, well, I built this relationship. I fell into, I fell into community with these people. Um, and then it turned immediately into her saying, well, I want to pay you to consult. I want you to be, you know, an expert who doesn't have to be obligated to do the work of writing the grant, but can come in and just help with methods. And then we can build up more if you want to be more directly involved or involved as a, as a co or something like that. And that to me was my first experience with that type of being approached in that way uh, as a collaborator. I think that's something that a lot of CAPS fellows would be open to as individuals. But in terms of the structure, what can cis allies do? I think it's really about what can you do to when you're doing your work, uplift the work that's being done by trans people, the work that's being led by us. Um, and we have a space on the website already that shows like a kind of extended collective CV, at least of just publications. And you are more than welcome to go peruse those to see what's already available. But I think it also comes down to like, when you have the funds, when you have the resources, when you have the the sort of momentum to put something together, like a conference, a symposium, a panel, um, an advisory board, who, you know, what's your instinct? Who do you reach out to? Who do you think of first? And I think what we would suggest is largely to think first of the people who have the lived experience and the existing expertise. And that's something that I think could be a pretty big sweeping cultural change if everybody took that up. 
Yeah, I think another example I would give is that um, I recently, and I'm not sure if TJ and Avery, you got this too, but recently got a request from someone who is a cis uh, scholar who works in trans studies, who I believe got like a request to speak about like trans topics and sent it out to uh, other trans people instead of taking it themselves. So um, that's one way that, um, that I think, you know, you can pass on some opportunities if you're like caught on to be like, uh, to speak on some uh, issue pertaining to trans people, you can maybe pass that on to um, your, to people who are, tr who are trans and are experts in trans research as well. So, you know, giving voice to um, trans people who are experts in the field. Do we have time for one more question? Yeah, why not? Let's we can try. <laughs> okay, well, let me take it from Philippe Comelli. Um, how can people from more distant uh, countries help or get involved with applied transgender studies? Great question. So um, there are a couple of different ways. The main one uh, to like now go kind of slightly counter to what I was saying earlier, a, a question response to becoming fellows. One of the major ways is becoming a fellow, right? Is becoming part of the community of work that we're doing and so that we're kind of you're like then tapping into this network of people working across different uh, cultural and national contexts. And so then suddenly we have this network of people who are all working on issues in your country and elsewhere, right? Um, and so um, that is part of it. But beyond that, yes, the more kind of typical parts of um, participating in the event or, or, or participating in the center through things like events, through things um, like the journal. Uh, there was another question elsewhere. I don't see it now, but there was one. I, about, I accidentally like, answered it, sorry. <laughs> the things like workshops, right? We will have things that are also more interactive than this current webinar format. We did that for this specific event, but we will have other things where people can become, uh, can come to events where they're actually actively participating in them. And so um, those will provide opportunities, hopefully, for there to be kind of deeper and more meaningful connections um, with scholars working kind of further afield than already where we are representing in our fellowship, in our membership. If I could also tack on to that just real quick, sorry. Um, and thanks y'all for your patience, because this is a lot of questions to get there. Um, yeah, I think something that I personally would love is um, for CAS to also, in a way, serve as a hub of existing experts that not just this people can come to, you know, ask for collaboration or consultation, but also um, folks who may, maybe don't have the same resources as those of us who are positioned at institutions in the global north, or the people who maybe are working in cultural and country specific contexts where on the ground, trans life looks vastly different than it does in the States or Canada or the places where we already have representation. And so if there are things that you're working on that you could use help on in the future, once we've got, you know, our footing a little bit more, I think that's something we'd be open to being approached about because it could be something that either an individual fellow at CAS is really interested in collaborating with you um, or, you know, helping you do the work and figure out what methods you need if, if you're at that phase or more so in figuring out ways to materially support it in the future. Again, the biggest question now is about funding and resources and, and who we can get to back us so that we can also make our agenda much more collaborative as opposed to just something that we design. But I think um, Leo's suggestion, which I accidentally clicked answer live and then I didn't know what I was doing. So I've never been a panelist on a webinar of doing workshops is fantastic. Um, I love that suggestion. I will cite you when we steal it. Um, but things like that or journal clubs or anything like that where we can have more conversational kind of informal environments where it doesn't, you know, it's not resource intensive for us to be able to do that. I think things like that can also be really great spaces for us to figure out what it means to collaborate across, you know, borders, across continents sometimes, and definitely across our, you know, situated geographical and sociocultural differences. So I think we'd love to be approached by folks. Uh, okay, and I guess with that, that brings this uh, inaugural event to a close. Um, from the founders, any final words? 
No, nothing really beyond just thank you all so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing many of you hopefully at our uh, future events and communicating with you over the email newsletter and other things like that. Um, thank you all so much for, for your interest, your passion and for joining us today. Um, and we look forward to working with all of you more moving forward. I just all want to say thank you so much, Paisley, for for managing the, the like extremely long train of questions and for agreeing to host us. You've been oh, it's my pleasure. to work with. I think this is really important, necessary work. So, all right. Yeah, sign up for our mailing list. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram at Trans Studies on both Twitter and Instagram. Okay, good. Wonderful. Bye, everyone.